so that we can put it on Moodle later. All right, so welcome ev back everyone, also people who are watching the recording. So um, what Morgan was doing is creating an F1 interbreed um, with X-linked genes, right? So these two phenotypes uh, that they were studying, they were located on the X chromosome. Um, and that means that when you are talking about males, um, males are called hemizygous recessive. So they are not heterozygous, they are hemizygous. And that, it, that means that they only have one copy of a gene or a DNA sequence in a diploid cell. And of course we nowadays know and that males have only one X chromosome and a Y chromosome, um, but and that means that males are more likely to pass on recessive alleles to daughters um, and they do not pass on any X-linked alleles to their sons at all because they pass on the Y chromosomes to their son. And this is also why when we're talking about Mendelian disorders, which are located on the X chromosome, you see that males are more susceptible to this because they have no uh, backup. They only have one single X chromosome. So if they have a broken gene on the X chromosome, they are always affected. While um, a, a daughter might be lucky and might have one broken copy, for example, from the father, um, but have a functional copy from the mother. So when we are talking about genetic disorders or diseases, um, especially when they are X-linked, uh, males are uh, much more affected or quicker affected than females. All right, so hemizygous recessive. I hope that that's clear. Um, so this is more or less the crossing scheme that they did um, and using an F2 crossing scheme. Um, so what, what you see here is, is that you have uh, wide eyes and miniature wings, a female, you have a wild type male, um, but the male of course has a, a, a Y chromosome which is denoted by this little arrow. Um, so you see um, wide eyes, miniature wings, here you have a wild type, a wild type eyes and wild type wings. For some reason, the W and the M are a little bit confusing. And then when you cross these, then of course all the females that you get will be wild type, and all the males that you get have, will have white eyes and miniature wings. If you then cross these two then what do you see? You see that in the F2, now there are different phenotypes that can occur. So of course we can get back the parental phenotypes, which means that they have wide eyes and miniature wings, so they look like the mother. We get individuals back which have a wild type um, appearance, so they have normal wings, normal eyes, and something interesting occurs in the F2 because you also get individuals which have wild eye, uh, white eyes but standard normal wild type wings and you have individuals which have wild type eyes and miniature wings so here in these individuals there was a kind of a recombination so in the female um, because the females are, are heterozygotes they have both the W and the M gene plus they have the W plus and uh, the M plus gene um, it, the genome can break between those two genes and then uh, when we can see is we can then count up in the F2 to see how many individuals we get so in this case we get 750 which have uh, the, 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 the phenotype of the mother, not the mother but the original mother we have 791 which get the phenotype of the original pair, uh, father and then we have a certain number of recombinants where a recombination took place between the wild, uh, white eyes and the, the, uh, the wings and here we have uh, a number of recombinants which have wild type eyes and miniature wings. So now we can then see that if we just, yeah, so if, they, if you do the experiment, yeah, we can see that there are five, uh, 1541 individuals which inherited the original parental genotypes, or the, the phenotypes in this case, and you see that there are 900 individuals who are recombinant. So from this experiment, they found that in the total offspring that they had, so 
2441 there were 900 which have been recombinated and then then the idea what they had is that but if you then calculate the ratio between the amount of, of recombinants versus the total amount of individuals that you have that you get a kind of distance measures so how far are these two genes apart and then you can very easily calculate that as a percentage so when you calculate that as a percentage you see that they are 36.9 percent away from each other so the distance on the genome on the X chromosome between the, the I phenotype and the wing phenotype is 36.9 centimorgans that's it. that's what they came up with so they did these types of experiments, not just for these two phenotypes, they did those experiments for a lot of different phenotypes. So if you look at the F2, we have some non-parental phenotypes. So in the F2, the most frequent phenotypes for both sexes were the phenotypes of the parents in the original cross. So white eyes, miniature wings, and red eyes with normal wings. The non-parental phenotypes occurred in around 37% uh, of the F2 flies. Um, had this is well below the 50% which is predicted if these two phenotypes would be independent, because if they would be independent you would expect half of the individuals to be, um, uh, to be um, recombinants and you would expect 50-50 recombinant versus non-recombinant. However, because you see that it's only 37%, they concluded that these two genes must be located on the same chromosome and they must be located on the sex chromosome because of their observation in the F1 where females are all not affected while all males are affected. So they did this for a whole bunch of them and then Hem Morgan did his proposition that during meiosis alleles of some genes uh, assort together because they are near each other on the same chromosome. Hey, and then re recombination occurs when genes are exchanged between the X chromosomes of the F1 females and this crossing over event occurs at the fourth chromatin stage of prophase 1 in meiosis. And of course this was not his proposition, um, hey, this, this is something that was figured out later. Hey, but each crossover event involves two of the four chromatids and all chromatids may be involved in crossing over um, as chiasma forms along the aligned chromosomes. So we will we will have a nice picture of that to kind of visualize that more. Hey, but this was his proposition and this is why a hundred years later we still talk about Thomas Hunt Morgan and about his experiments with Drosophila. And so imagine two Mendelian traits. Um, on the chromosome they can be very far, very far apart hey, and then there's a low chance that the offspring will get both phenotypes because there's a high chance that when you have two chromosomes next to each other hey, that there will be a recombination between the chromosomes. And so if they are far apart hey, then the percentage, the distance between them will be very close to 50%. It will be less than 50% because if it is 50% the two genes are located on different chromosomes. But if it is lower than 50%, but not very much lower, like 37%, it means that these genes are relatively far apart. If they are very close together, located on the chromosome, of course, then there is a high chance that the offspring will get both phenotypes, right? So that means that the, the, the percentage of recombinants, so the number of recombinants that you observe in an F2 will go down, meaning that the, the percentage, so the, the, the recombinants divided by the total amount will be smaller as well, so the distance will be, will be closer. So this is called a two-point cross. So a two-point cross is when you take a heterozygous individual, um, an AB, AB, and you cross this with a homozygous individual, which is AABB. And this, like, we, like I showed you, this can be used to determine if genes are linked or if they are independent. So if two genes or phenotypes are on the same chromosome or if they're on different chromosomes and when they are on the same chromosome you can estimate the distance between these two in the, uh, phenotypes uh, by doing the computation where you take the number of offspring which have recombinant phenotypes divided by the total number of offspring and then you multiply by a hundred so you get in this case in this example here you get that there are 17 map units difference 
between the individuals. So that means 17% of the individuals in the F2 is recombinant um, out of the total population. So when we talk about genes in a point crosses, what we, we mean phenotypes, which are Mendelian. So hey, we're not talking about genetics yet. Hey, all of this is theory which was developed way, way before we knew that DNA existed. And these things occur in, in, in many different crosses. So the point cross that you see here is not a two-point cross, but it is a three-point cross. And that is because there are three different genes, so to speak. Hey, so you have an A, a B, and a C gene. And here, when you use a, 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 a three-point cross, um, you can also determine the order of the genes. So if the order is A, B, C, or if the order is A, C, B, or if it is B, C, A. Um, so these things you can also determine in a three-point cross. But we will come back to the three-point cross. Uh, but if we talk about these Mendelian phenotypes and we want to do this type of mapping, uh, the difference between an individual which is heterozygous needs to be very clearly different from an individual that is homozygous. For example, a Mendelian phenotype. Because for complex phenotypes, these point crosses don't really work because there's not just a single gene involved. There might be two or more genes involved in creating your phenotype. And then, of course, this whole theory of, of Mendelian genetics and Mendelian inheritance doesn't work to determine uh, the order of uh, things on a chromosome. Um, so again, the two-point cross example. Yep, we set up the test cross. We look at the uh, individuals that come out. Um, hey, we cross again with, with a, a double mutant. So we have just a, a, a wild type. Then we have a mutant. Um, we get offspring, which is, of course, um, heterozygote, and then we cross this with a homozygote double mutant, and then we look to see um, how many recombinants do we get compared to the total amount of um, individuals that we get in the F2 cross. So of course you have to literally do hundreds or thousands of, end of, uh, of animals um, to figure out the order of two of these genes or the distance between two of the genes. So in a, in a three-point cross, you can determine if genes are length and independent, just like in a two-point cross. You can get the distance between the genes, between gene A and B. You get a distance between B and C, but you also get a distance between A and C. And because you get three distances, and you, get, and, and you can then infer the order on the chromosome. So if the order is ABC, BAC, or ACB, and so you can see that, well, if the distance from A to C is, is small, the distance from A to B is big, uh, and the distance from B to C is small again, then of course the order on the genome would be, well, um, first you have A at the beginning, then B at the end, and C is somewhere in the middle, because the distance from A to C is smaller than the distance from A to B. So you can then figure out the order on the genome. And, and three-point crosses are almost always done between a heterozygote, so an individual which is having more or less three mutations, um, and an individual which is wild type, so which has no broken alleles. All right, so when you design an experiment, um, you, you want to collect data uh, on as many phenotypes or uh, or traits as possible um, and an example would be that you take a, a, an individual which has genes P, R and J um, have some with mutations so a heterozygous individual and you cross it with a homozygous and so in the progeny each gene has two possibilities um, so for the three genes there are eight expected phenotypic classes in the progeny so two to the power of three because hey, every gene can be in two forms and then they can be either independent so when they are independent you will get eight different types of individuals which have a combination of these three uh, phenotype classes. So here is a little bit of an example and this is the example of Mendel. Um, so here you can clearly see that in this case P, R and J are for example yellow, elongated and dry which is the wild type pepper um, or um, wild type thingy here. And then you have, for example, a purple, round and juicy 
Um, yeah, so yeah, these are very clear phenotypes which you can distinguish from each other and then you cross them and then in the offspring yeah, you see the following phenotypes so you see the wild type you see the purple round and juicy so these are the parentals and here we see the other possibilities so the other six possibilities that can occur and then you look at the numbers and then based on the numbers you can then calculate what the distance is between um, the, the yellow versus the round and the distance versus the yellow versus the dry and the dry versus the elongated so you can get different distance measurements and it's it's every time the same thing you take the number of recombinants and you divide it by the total amount and you do that for each of the recombinants so you see yellow and purple um, yellow and purple yellow and purple and so you you add up in this case these two for one distance measurement you add up these two for the other distance measurement and you add up these two for the third distance measurement and then based on that you can figure out the order of the genome so one of the um, one of the uh, assignments for today will be to analyze one of these test crosses and to do or to to show and uh, to to kind of get a little bit of, of a hang of how to do a two-point cross and how to do a three-point cross all right, so um, yeah, the recombination frequency is the ratio of non-parental phenotypes to the total amount of individuals. It is expressed as a percentage, um, which is equivalent to the number of MAP units or centimorgans between two genes. And so uh, if a hundred out of a thousand individuals display the phenotype resulting from a crossover, then the recombination frequency is 10%, and that means that A and B are 10 MAP units apart on the genome. All right, so Thomas Morgan Hunt did this for a lot of phenotypes. And then they ordered these phenotypes on a genome and then they found um, more or less. So they, they looked at all kinds of different phenotypes, for example, the, the, the bristles on the, on the, um, on the, um, on the fly. Uh, they did this for the wings, they did this for the, the, the shape of the leg, and then in the end, in 1917, they came up with the following genetic map, um, and had, this genetic map is still accurate today. Even with all the research that we did on, on DNA and mapping genes and knowing where genes are, the genetic map that was drawn by Morgan in 1917 based on his observation of Mendelian phenotypes is still accurate up until like five centimorgans today. So it is, a, a, the, the, the quote here is a quote um, from, a, from um, I don't know whose quote it is actually. Um, but the, the quote is that Morgan's theory of the chromosome represents a great leap of imagination comparable with Galileo or Newton. It is, it is, it's, a, it's a massive step in genetics, going from having just a theory about genes and them being on a string to having an ability to kind of create these maps of where on the genome are these genes located. And this is all 50 years before they even know that DNA was the carrier of genetic information. They didn't know anything about that DNA existed or what was the thing that was inherited but they could already draw maps of how far certain phenotypes were from each other and um, hey you can see that hey, literally tens of thousands of little drosophila flies were used hey, all of them were crossed in a three-point crossing structure hey, and you can see here all the different phenotypes that they used in 1917 like minute bristles rough eyes cardinal eyes uh, javelin bristles um, and so there's there's a lot of very interesting uh, phenotypes that they had they had a lot of these drosophila mutants and every time that they found a new mutant they would do a two-point or three-point cross and then put the new phenotype phenotype on the genetic map that they were filling and it's a it's a massive massive advantage that we have this nowadays for drosophila and it also made drosophila one of the most popular animals in in genetics um, which is one of the biggest leaps forward in in genetics all right so when we look at genetic maps today um, and then we have high resolution maps meaning that we have a marker probably every like 
tenth of a centimorgan um, and these are genetic markers so real markers that we obtain by things like uh, 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 PCR um, but they are also still phenotypic markers in a lot of the genetic maps so if you look at mice uh, mice also have a lot of Mendelian phenotypes and the genetic map of mice um, has real DNA markers in there so where you have to do a PCR test to determine if something is like the short fragment or the long fragment but there's a lot of classical phenotypes still on on the map um, and so and you can only do that you can only put a phenotype on a map if there's a clear difference between um, the, the phenotypic observation and of course nowadays we can do whole genome sequencing and we can uh, determine the exact position of a gene up until like one base pair precise um, and these physical maps use molecular tools rather than data from crossover studies but a lot of geneticists still like working on the original like genetic map instead of using a base pair map they still use a genetic map um, which is kind of supplemented with the phenotypic information and of course this phenotypic information can be used to kind of validate if you did not mix up your individuals because if you look at an individual and this individual should have gotten the um, red eye phenotype but your individual does not have red eyes then of course you know that somewhere some individual got in the wrong test tube and at these things you can't really see when you're using genomic sequencing because then you just see base pairs or you see that long fragment short fragment but there's no expectation on what what you should get from a certain cross um, but um, nowadays we can use molecular technologies but still the, the, the genetic maps created by the phenotypes are still very useful especially when it comes to kind of when samples have been mixed up all right so there was all that I wanted to say about genetic maps and Thomas Hunt Morgan and now we are coming to the complex phenotype part so complex phenotypes are phenotypes which have differences in many genes and all of these differences just contribute a very little bit to the whole phenotype that you observe um, so things like human human stature so what's your height um, is something in which like hundreds and hundreds of genes are involved um, the same thing goes for a phenotype like obesity or flowering time or milk yield and these are all phenotypes in which there's no single gene which causes a massive difference no there are dozens of genes which all cause a little bit of a difference and so in that case when when you are working in genetics and you are trying to determine which locus or which part of the genome has an influence on your phenotype be it human stature or be it obesity and you try to assign the variance that you see in the phenotype to these little parts of the genome um, to get an overview of where there are genes which are involved in regulating milk yield for example alright so when we talk about complex phenotypes we talk about the genetic architecture underlying a phenotype so which genes are involved and how much do they contribute to the eventual phenotype and there's two major technologies or or methods to to kind of deal with these kinds of complex phenotypes and one of them is QTL mapping and in QTL mapping you use an inbred population to study complex traits so you take two or three or four or five founder animals and then you cross them in a certain way so that you you kind of determine uh, the structure of the genome yeah, so that you know that every individual has 25 percent from the original mother and and 75 percent of the original father and so you can have because we can do this in for example mice or drosophila or or cows well not so much in cows but um, in, in many of these populations we can kind of design how the genetics of our population should look like and more or less based on, on the theory that we have from Mendel and, 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 and Thomas Morgan. Um, 
The other side is to do a genome-wide association study. So a genome-wide association study is, has the same goal as a QTL mapping experiment, find genes which are contributing to a complex trait. But in a genome-wide association study, you use a natural population. So for example, humans, we cannot decide who is going to procreate with whom. So we just have to do with what we got. Right, because we can't interfere in, in human reproduction um, and you cannot set up experiments, that's highly illegal. Um, so when, then we're forced to do a genome-wide association study. So both of these try to do the same thing, but the QTL mapping is based on the original theory of, of Mendel and Thomas Hunt Morgan, where you're setting up a, a, a structured population, also called an inbred population, um, and in a GWAS you are looking at a natural population um, and hey you have no influence on the genetics of that population but you can use both of these different populations to study which genes are underlying a complex trait. All right and then this was originally the place where I decided to have the break um, but we'll just continue since I've only been recording for 25 minutes so um, before the break, we talked about Mendelian and complex phenotypes. I told you about what is linkage. So linkage is more or less how far apart two things are on a genome and how you can make genetic maps from Mendelian phenotypes using a two-point cross to determine the distance and then using a three-point cross to determine the order um, of how things are located on the genome. Um, after the break, which we will just continue um, is that we will look at some databases with different phenotypical information um, and I want to say some words about the statistical analysis of, of different phenotypes. Um, and of course the statistics will come back uh, and the databases are something that we will need for the assignments because the assignments will of course have you taking a look into the database and trying to figure out um, for example, what gene in humans is color causing uh, color blindness in, in males. All right, so a little bit of a definition. What is a database? So a database is an organized collection of data. It is the collection of schemas, tables, queries, reports, views, and other objects. So in a way, when I think about a database, I always think about like a big Excel th table, um, which is storing data and has like references from one sheet to another sheet. Um, has so the tables are of course very clear what it is. The schema is more or less like what what are the different columns. Um, the queries are well, how would you query it? Like you have like in Excel filtering options to say well only show me elements for which column number two has a value larger than five um, and then a report and a view are more or less how are these things linked to to each other so how how is one table related to the other tables and of course physically when you talk about what is a database it's nothing more than a dedicated computer um, which holds the actual database and has database software running on there and things like uh, a communications API to talk to the database. Um, but so a database, spiritually, it's more or less a collection of organized data. Physically, it's a, a server. Uh, it's just a computer somewhere which has a database program on there. All right, so some of the phenotypes uh, or uh, phenotypical databases that I want you to know and want you to look at is uh, the IMPC, which is the International Mouse Phenotype Consortium. Um, this is a very interesting consortium where they knock out all of the genes in mice one by one. So there's told you that there are around 20,000 genes in mice. Um, so what they are doing is, is they are using CRISPR-Cas uh, and other molecular technologies to knock out a certain gene out of the genome. Then they make a cross um, and so they, they, they reproduce animals which have this gene knocked out and then they look to see how their classical phenotypes change based on if this gene is there or if this gene is deleted in the genome. Um, and this is a massive undertaking, there's literally like hundreds of universities involved um, and the database is a really good database if you want to know uh, what your gene is doing in, in mice. So hey, if you are during your PhD thesis and you are interested in a certain gene like 
retinol saturase or something like that and then you can go to this database and you can see well what happens to a mouse when this gene is removed from the genome. Um, the OMIM database is the online Mendelian inheritance in men. It is the way, uh, the, the place to go if you want to know about Mendelian phenotypes or Mendelian diseases in humans. Um, so it's a big database and it has more or less information on any Mendelian phenotype that we know of. Um, for example, where is it located? Um, who has studied it? Um, which papers have been published about this phenotype and it's a really really um, really really good resource if you're interested in Mendelian phenotypes. Uh, then there's the gen to fen database which is the genotype to phenotype database which is more or less the same thing as the OMIM database but it is more focused on uh, complex phenotypes. So they, they have like Mendelian phenotypes in there as well but had they are a collection of all the relationships that people have found using genome-wide association in humans uh, between genes and phenotypes um, in humans. And then there's gene network. Um, I always want to show gene network because I've been working with the people who develop it. So gene network is developed by Rob Williams who works for the University of Tennessee Memphis um, and they uh, have a big phenotype database on mice. Uh, not just any mice but BXD mice. So this is a cross between two inbred mouse strains and there's around 150 to 200 um, kind of immortalized mouse lines that came out of this um, and they have like massive massive amount of, of phenotype information but also endophenotypes so things like uh, gene expression data, uh, protein measurements, metabolite measurements so hey if you're ever interested in um, well um, I have this gene or I have this phenotype that I'm interested in um, which genes in the genomes are correlated to my phenotype of interest um, then you can can go to this database of course there's there's hundreds and hundreds of more phenotypic databases um, but you have to make a cutoff somewhere so hey, I, the, the, the ONIM database is really good when you look at Mendelian phenotypes uh, the IMPC is also really fun because they are kind of knocking out genes which is kind of a Mendelian thing right so you you knock out a single gene and then you see what changes in the mouse um, but it's not really Mendelian because they're they're kind of muddling with the genome and not so much with the phenotype and then the the other two databases are more or less for really complex uh, diseases so complex phenotypes if you want to look into that all right, so IMPC, um, this is more or less what it looks like. Um, I wanted to do more or less a live demo at this point. So uh, let me see if the database still looks the same. Ah, not so much. So um, at the IMPC, uh, their goal is to produce germline transmissions of targeted knockout mutations. So what they do is in embryonic stem cells, um, they have two. 20,000 known and predicted mouse genes and they test each mutant mouse line through a broad-based primary phenotyping pipeline in all major adult organ systems and most areas of, of major human diseases and they provide a centralized data service and portal for free which is really really good. Um, so um, currently they have knocked out around 7,022 genes of the 20,000 20, genes that are in mice. Um, so um, let's take a look at the website, so let's see if this works. So here we see the current IMPC website. Um, so there's two ways of searching, so you can search for genes and you can search for phenotypes. Um, yes, uh, just use the cookies. So pff, does anyone have a gene of interest where they are interested in like Many of you are probably in a master phase of your study, so hey, you either are 
doing a master project or thinking about doing a master project um, or of course when you have a phenotype of interest then just throw it in the chat and we can have a quick look in the IMPC database. Um, I didn't really prepare, I have some of my own favorite genes so we can look at that um, but I think it's more fun if uh, you have genes. Alright so SOX21 first one on the list. So SOX21, it is called the um, SHRI gene. It's the sex determining regions on Y. Um, so you can see here um, what they have on it. So we can just click on the link. Um, so here you see that um, the MGI ID, the, uh, so here they have not assessed viability yet, there is no embryo viewer yet, um, and it is currently not registered for phenotyping. So phenotyping is currently not planned. So unfortunately SOX21 is one of these genes which probably when they tried knocking it out, um, produced to be lethal it happens sometimes. So sometimes you knock out a gene and then you figure out that this gene is essential for um, living. Um, but they did do, um, um, you can still order mouse which have a mutant in here. So you see that they have two mice um, which have been so here they produce mice. So here the whole gene was deleted. Um, so there's a deletion and then the other one is a gene which is a vector knockout so they put like a lock set operon into the gene um, but unfortunately these have these have not been phenotyped so you can't really see the nice thing about what this gene um, so one of the genes that we study in our group is bbs7 so just to show you how the website looks when there is actually phenotypic data. Um, so here you can see that they produced embryonic stem cells, then they produced mice, and then they did push all of these mice uh, through the phenotypic database. And then um, we get the newsletter. No, we just have to click on it. Um, and then hey, when you click on it, you see here in an overview more or less the things which are significantly changed and what is not significantly changed. So you can see, for example, that the cardiovascular system of mice has no significant changes when you knock out the BBS7 gene. Um, however, um, their behavior or neurological behavior is significantly changed. And one of the things that you see here is, is that there is a significant change in the metabolism of these mice and in the adipose tissue. So our group we study something called the Berlin fat mouse and um, we identified that BBS7 is one of the top candidate genes to explain why the Berlin fat mouse is fat because there's a, a, a mutation in our gene and this mutation causes these mice um, to be um, well more or less extremely obese um, hey, but then hey, you can see that there are four phenotypes which are significantly different between mice which have, an, have a, 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 a knockout um, so they're either heterozygously knocked out or homozygously knocked out um, so you see when, when the gene is knocked out heterozygously you see that there are abnormal lens morphology which means that there are some issues with the eyes um, and there is abnormal pre -pro pre-pulse inhibition um, and they have an increase in sodium so there's more salt in their in their blood um, and then hey, you can then click on it and you can get more information so hey, they, they for example looked at all of the different anatomies um, hey, so they they have images as well when you want to see where a certain gene is expressed um, and hey, they, they also have like for each of the mice that they produce they do all kinds of x-ray images um, to to show you what is different um, with with these mice. Um, so hey, when you, for example, go to the ab abnormal lens morphology, hey, then you can get an overview of what it is. Um, hey, and then in total they had 3,984 mice that ha they have assayed. And then you see actually where the, the differences are coming from. Hey, so you, you can just look at a gene. Hey, you can look at, for example, measurements. So hey, you can... Um, you can get the data for different phenotypes and you can you can look at the data and so here you see for example that they if you would 
think about grip strength and then you can you can see um, for example the grip strength on the bottom and so you see that um, heterozygous animals have um, a, a slight difference in grip strength but it is not a significant difference but you can see here that the pre-pulse inhibition um, which is an assay that, um, um, that that is used when you when you scare mice and then you can see that they are Eas more easily scared uh, than normal wild type mice and hey you can look at um, for example uh, the uh, one of the things is for example the, the metabolism um, and here you can also see that hey, there are no massively significant differences but you can see that on average had they have um, 70 uh, the, the effect size is, is there, so hey, you see that the fat mass, the fat lean mass, um, is different from the individuals which have a knockout compared to the individuals that don't. Um, so it's a very good first start to kind of get an idea of what your gene might be doing. Um, so hey, if you are working on a gene in the future, um, then it's always worth to put the gene into the, um, uh, the IMPC database to see if there's a mouse knockout and to kind of get an idea what this gene might be involved in. And so in this case we learned that hey, it, is, um, it is significantly associated with mortality because if you knock out two gene copies, so hey, you, you make a mouse which doesn't have this gene at all, then it dies um, before it's born. Um, hey, if you look at the metabolism, you see that there's a significant change in, in the metabolism of these mice. Um, they have some behavioral issues and there is a significant difference in, in the morphology of the eyes. And so if, if you are interested in like, oh, so hey, what would be the best tissue to study this gene? Um, and then you could say, well, probably brain or eye tissue or fat uh, tissue would be very good candidate tissues to begin with. Um, and like I said, they currently have 722 knocked out genes. Um, so it is almost half of the genes in the genome that they, that they were able to knock out at this point and get some, some phenotype data on. Um, and hey, you can you can search by human disease. You can search by phenotype. So if you're interested in, um, for example, um, uh, length or something like that, nah, length in a mouse is not so BMI, for example. Um, uh, that doesn't find it. Homeostasis metabolism. Um, so you can just click through, and then. Yeah, there's two and a half thousand genes which have an influence on that, hey, and then you see that something like um, length of tail maybe yeah that would be a good uh, so that would be tail length abnormal tail length it's called so when you look at abnormal tail lengths you see that nine genes have an have a significant effect on the length of tail so it's the CNT C A CANT1 gene, CYP561, DNA1, FGF7, HOCC12, and so you get a list of genes which they found to significantly affect the length of the tail. And of course this is a very good resource to put next to your own data that you have collected and to see if there might be an overlap or to figure out which tissue you might want to look into. Um, and so there's a lot of genes that people might be interested in and if you're lucky they have a knockout if you're unlucky then they don't have a knockout um, but that it's a very good database for a first start to kind of get an idea what might my gene be doing or which genes might be interesting to study when I'm interested in uh, a certain phenotype um, so also human diseases so I don't know if they have Alzheimer um, no so when we go to human diseases, rare diseases like um, do they have a good example of a human disease which they might um, color blind? No, you can't test mice if they're color blind. So what would be things like stroke or something would be probably uh, no uh, phenotypes. So stroke. Stroke. 
they have abnormal blood circulation, decreased cardiac stroke volume. Yeah, that's not really what I wanted. But so if you obese, yeah, obesity will get you like hundreds of <laughs> of genes. So abnormal body weight, abnormal body size. Um, All right, I'm just gonna copy paste that one to Saurus. I'm I'm interested if they. No, there's no. Uh... Perhaps if I search it for. Like this, no, no, they don't have a phenotype called like that. Um, but if you are, that's probably something blood, right? So blood disease or. Um, blue skin disease. So that would be skin. Skin hemorrhages, scaly skin, flaky skin, abnormal skin, loose skin, dry skin, reddish skin, cyanosis, abnormal skin pigmentation. That that might be the, the one that abnormal skin coloration. So it might be that it, it falls under this category. And of course, like you have images for all of them. So if you're interested you can go through all the images of the different skin types of the mice to see if one of them might have had blue skin um, so it's a it's a it's a nice explorative database um, to get an idea of what your uh, gene might be doing um, and so you can also see that this thing is it so this gene is the um, tail color so the, the skin color of the tail but there's also the foot pad skin color underneath the foot of the mice um, and you see that there are literally like 199 112 genes which are significantly associated with an abnormal skin coloring that they found in in their pipeline um, so a very interesting database if you have a gene or if you have a phenotype Throw it in, see if something comes up. If something comes up, then you can kind of investigate further. Um, but it is, and since they are only halfway through, um, and of course, hey, there's phenotypes which are only occurring when you have two broken genes or when you have three broken genes together. Um, but hey, this gives you an idea of what every gene individually is doing in the genome and if it is um, important to, to have this gene. All right, so far the IMPC database, there's more information on, on the, the IMPC um, and it's a good starting point. If you if you have to write, so if, if for example you, um, it's an inhibition of hemoglobin uh, like through nitrite toxicity, not actually skin coloration. Okay, well probably if you would just search for hemoglobin, that's a gene, right? Hemoglobin. Is it hemo or hemoglobin? I think it's hem hemoglobin. Should figure out what that gene is because there there is probably a hemoglobin kind of gene. Hemoglobin. Um, <laughs> It's protein. What's the what's the identifier for it? Um, HBB. So it's just called HBB. All right. So they have phenotype data available. Um, so we can look at this one to see what if they have any skin colorations or come on go internet all right so here we see that there is significant differences in the immune system um, so um, abnormal red blood cell distribution abnormal mean corpus hemoglobin increased red blood cells and then head so you can so these are the phenotypes which are very, very significantly affected when you when you knock out hemoglobin. Um, you can see that you can actually knock it out homozygously and it's not lethal, um, which I would think that you would need hemoglobin. Um, but uh, uh, Anna Margareta enabled emote only mode for this room. Okay, thank you for disabling that. Otherwise, people would only be able to talk in emojis, which would make it a little bit difficult. 
Oh, that's okay. That's okay. You can play around with all the things. Like I have this nice button on my stream manager which says start watch party. I have no idea what it does, but I think when I click it, we will be in a world of hurt. <laughs> All right, so f so far the uh, the IMPC database. It's a it's just a very straightforward database. It's it's interesting to um, to search through it, um, and if you're very interested in a fer very specific phenotype, you can always see if there's anything that that they have um, there um, as a starting point. So you can go from a phenotype to a gene, and you can go from a gene to a phenotype, um, and the gene to phenotypes is very broad. Like you can see that they measure literally anything that you can measure on a mouse so they do more or less all the all the developmental tests and all of the other tests uh, so that, that it's a good database to uh, to have a look at all right so back to the PowerPoint um, OMIM so OMIM is uh, a very similar database um, but it's not based on people knocking out things in a mouse or uh, in another organism it is the online Mendelian inheritance in men um, so it is um, the database when you are interested in Mendelian diseases um, there is one um, uh, there's one assignment or two assignments for today um, where you have to go into OMIM and uh, figure out um, what is causing color blindness um, but then just let us um, first look at the definition or the, the, the way that they describe themselves so OMIM is a comprehensive authoritative compendium of human genes and genetic phenotypes that is freely available and updated daily um, so um, the full text reference overviews in OMIM contain information on all known Mendelian disorders and over 12,000 genes OMIM focuses on the relationship between phenotype on one hand and genotype on the other hand um, so quick look at the database um, when we look here at OMIM this is how it looks and here we could actually probably look for your methylomoglobin um, so let's just try that um, so here you see that there are 17 different entries for your phenotype of interest um, Testosaurus uh, and um, had the first four are uh, methoglobina due to deficiency of methemoglobin reductase um, so this actually is a um, Mendelian phenotype so when you click on it um, they, they have all kinds of different names and different descriptions uh, then you can go down it it shows you where the gene, so where the phenotype is located because it's a Mendelian phenotype it has a location on the genome just like a, a phenotype in Drosophila um, and had they put it at location 22Q13.2 uh, which means that it's on chromosome 22 and then Q13 has to do with the banding in humans um, of course um, you can you can figure out which location it is exactly by just clicking on it and it should give you an overview of the whole chromosome and so it's this uh, chromos uh, cytochrome B5 reductase 3 which is causing the met methemoglobinemia <laughs> it is a difficult term um, so, um, and you see that it's next to this um, alpha 14 galactosylotransferase which is actually causing different blood group glute types so it's it's in the neighborhood of, of other phenot or other genes which have different phenotypes um, but if we go back to the to the overview um, then you can see that it has a nice little bit of text uh, describing the phenotype it's autosomal dominant um, it's referred to as the M type it is caused by a variation in hemoglobin A or hemoglobin B um, and then it has some description of the phenotype that we're interested in um, then it has um, it is also associated it's also supposed to be associated with heart disease um, we can we can see um, 
So Gibson and Barcroft, so the, the phenotype was first described in 1948, 1945, correctly concluded that erythrocytes from affected individuals were unable to reduce, form continuously at a normal rate, credited with the identification of as an enz enzymatic defect in a reductase, increased circulation levels of which is brown, gives the skin a bluish color which appears as cyanosis. In the normal state, about 1% of hemoglobin exists as metaglobin, individuals become symptomatic when they rise above 25%, vascular collapse, coma and death can occur when methoglobin levels below 70% in total hemoglobin. So it is actually a pretty dangerous disease if, if it's not. Uh, and then here you have the different subtypes um, which they describe and the nice thing is is all of these are link outs to real papers that you can just click on and then read the original paper. Um, but hey, it's a very, very good entry point if you want to learn something about a certain Mendelian disease. Um, and it gives you an overview, in this case an overview of, of around like 80 years of research in uh, just a single web page. Um, hey, it describes the different types who have worked on it, why, when they've worked on it, um, hey, it's even very detailed. Um, and hey, biochemical features, the diagnosis, how to manage it clinically, the molecular genetics, uh, popular population genetics, so and they have a really really good overview of, uh, of, of a disease. So if you're interested in things like uh, or if in, in a Mendelian disease and you want to learn more about it then definitely check it out in OMIM because OMEN is the authoritative database when it comes to Mendelian diseases. And you can see why, right? Because this is just one of four pages that they have about uh, this, this disease. Um, they have a very good overview of citations and it is all curated. So that means that real scientists or well, real science, that sounds a little bit weird, but it means that real people have checked the data and made sure that everything is correct, which is different from a computer um, just searching through PubMed and, and trying to find out uh, certain things. And so a lot of um, a lot of citations, a lot of information about your disease that you are interested in. Um, and it might teach you something that you didn't know, it might confirm stuff that you already knew and it will give you a whole bunch of citations to start working on. And especially the, the latest citations are interesting because that shows you how far people have gotten. So what is the latest research on your disease of interest? Of course, OMIM is very focused on disease and that's the only real problem that I have with it because in many cases um, especially in biology or um, in, in kind of genetics you're not so much interested in diseases but you're interested in like phenotypes and so one of the things that we do is for example look for genes that have an influence on milk production in cows or we look for genes which are in plants increasing yield and then of course OMIM is not the right source to start um, but a very good database in case you ever get to work with human genetics um, and um, it, um, there are many many different diseases that you can look into um, so just color blindness um, it will um, give you a whole bunch of different types of color blindness like partial um, proton doton series and you, you can you can click on them um, hey, and then you can see that again they have in this case a short slightly shorter history um, but it's a very good starting point if you want to learn or want to get into a certain field so hey if, if you're ever applying for a job and you know that these people are investigating methemoglobinemia then read the OMIM page on that disease and then hey, you, you have a very broad understanding of what people in this field have been doing in the last 20 to 80 years um, which of course it has a big chance of increasing your chances of getting a job um, so very interesting database, um, very very interesting uh, phenotypes that are in there and of course had things like earwax um, should, should be in the database as well um, so 
aprocline grand secretion uh, yeah so here you have the earwax wet and dry which is located on chromosome 16 12 uh, dot one um, and then you can you can click on this and hey, there's a there's a whole description on earwax and and how population genetically it is um, and the the aboriginal Ainu population of the island of Hokkaido has an exceptionally high frequency of the dominant wet earwax phenotype compared to those of neighboring Asian population and so they, they really give you a good overview of, 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 of current knowledge in the field of this phenotype all right so enough or or like you can you can open up the website yourself and throw in a couple of phenotypes i'm just i just wanted to show you guys that it's a really useful database if you're interested in mendelian diseases all right so next database that i wanted to show you guys and this is actually a screenshot of the old version i think the new version is live um so this is gene network um it it's a it's a database which is a group of linked data sets and tools used to study complex networks of genes, molecules and higher order functions and phenotype. Um, it contains more than 25 years of legacy data generated by hundreds of scientists together with sequencing data and massive transcriptome data sets such as expression genetics or EQTL data set. Um, and again, this is a very mouse centric database. Um, there are databases very similar to this um, for plants like Arabidopsis or for um, say elegans um, so hey if if you are working on a different species um, then just googling around a little bit will give you a phenotype database unique for your species um, G network again a, a database based on mice but that's just because I have a mouse genetics background um, so let's take a look at the database so Gene Network is genenetwork.org um, and this is the, the new version that we are currently working on and you can select your species so you see that they have mouse data but also human data data on rats, on monkeys, Drosophila, barley, Arabidopsis, poplar um, which is um, a tree, uh, soybean and tomatoes and I think they're working on switchgrass oh you can't see my uh, drop down Oh, that's interesting that it doesn't capture the drop-down menu. All right, so when I click the drop-down menu, it tells me which different species I can select. Um, then when I have selected a certain species, and this probably you can... That's bad that it doesn't capture that. Um, so um, have for mice, uh, the BXD family is the, the, the main database that it originally started with. Um, and... Um, um, they have many many different families of mice so for example the new collaborative cross mice are in there which are mice which are generated from eight different founder strains um, but also the um, BXH family they have the mouse diversity panel and then they for example have aged BXDs they have like longevity studies they have uh, the uh, cannabis pilot that they did um, so if you're interested in which genes are correlated with cannabis use in mice um, then hit they have a database specially set up for that where you can then cross-reference these genes to for example well do these genes that are correlated with cannabis use also show uh, for example an increase in in fat mass right you can think the mice might get like the munchies so they want to eat a lot of stuff so they they there might be genes that when you give cannabis to mice comes up also in in obesity research um, but they have a lot of different families a lot of different uh, data sets um, so and there's there's a lot of different information in here and again you can just get any gene so the gene that is actually the standard gene that I always search for is the SHH, so the Sonic Hedgehog gene. Um, so Sonic Hedgehog is one of these genes which is kind of famous. Um, and I can show you a little bit of how the how the database looks like. So here you see that we're looking at um, a single probe which is located in the Sonic Hedgehog gene, which is distal to the three prime UTR. Um, and then you can see here, for example, you can do some statistics. So they have measured 71 BXD mice. Um, the mean expression of this gene is 9.2 and you see what ranges hey, but 
um, the nice thing what you can do here is for example you can calculate the correlations and then you could say well what gene does this sonic hedgehog gene correlate with uh, what might be the interaction partners of this gene um, there's different mapping tools so you can just do a QTL scan so you can take the expression of this gene and then go across the genome and see if there's a locus on the genome somewhere which is correlated with the expression of the gene um, and then there's um, a hit then if you are looking at your data you can also live edit the data if you wanted to and then use the data that you edit it um, to do QTL scans or do correlations. Um, so they have a whole bunch of tools in here um, so they you can for example look at different SNPs in the, the mice or the humans or the barley or whatever you select it. Um, you can do a FIWAS which is a, a different type of genome-wide association. Um, and you can browse the genome um, and there's a lot of additional stuff in there um, but I just wanted to show you the database and um, especially since I'm I've worked on the database as well and I've been contributing back data um, so a lot of the data on the Berlin fat mouse um, is also found in this database so and it's not only just the BXD mice um, but there are um, other mouse strains and there's humans in there there's barley in there and poplar trees so that the database is, is getting bigger and bigger and here above you see actually more analysis that you can do when you select like a group of genes and so you can for example do weighted co-expression gene networks or CTL maps or, or other types of, of analysis like network analysis um, so one of the nice things is all of this data is of course free and you can just download like large data sets if you want to um, which of course is, is very useful um, different types of searching you can search by different chromosomes and positions and I, I always like this visualization where you can see who is currently using it so of course I'm the one in Berlin using it um, but there's also someone in Atlanta Georgia currently on the website using the website um, and so um, very interesting database, um, a lot of free information um, and um, there's probably a couple of nature publications in the database which have never been discovered because it, like there's so much data that it takes like hundreds of years to do all kinds of analysis to kind of figure out uh, what you what you want. All right so that's gene network um, very mouse centric in that sense but it's becoming more and more broader could you check for a relationship between sonic hedgehog and sox 21 yeah sure you can do that um, so let's go to firefox um, then we would do sonic hedgehog so we would search for sonic hedgehog first um, we would add the two probes to my shopping cart so i will just say um, create a new collection so yum so create now oh, um, so I can just create a collection like that so then I have the two sonic hedgehog genes in there then I can go back and I can look for SOX21 I can search and then here so SOX21 has three genes so I take the three genes and I add them to my collection so now I have a collection of uh, the different genes and now I could do for example correlations and then it will do the correlations between them um, so you can see that um, so here we see SOX21 the first three so um, there is actually a significant correlation between SOX21 and the Sonic Hedgehog um, when you would click on the correlation I think it will give you a scatter plot so here on the one axis you see the um, 509 which is the uh, hippocampus expression of SOX21 and on the other axis you see the expression of um, Sonic Hedgehog so you see that when you uh, the higher your expression level of um, Sonic Hedgehog, the lower your expression level of SOX21.
So there, there seems to be a relationship um, between, so a negative, re negative correlation uh, between the two, uh, which might mean that they are part of the same pathway or that they are co-regulated in some way. Uh, but you see that this relationship is not perfect, um, uh, so, but uh, you can look at the individual points and you can then see what their, uh, uh, what their um, uh, relationship is. And of course, uh, because these are probes on a microarray, they are targeting very specific parts of the of the gene. Um, so if you would, if we go, would go back, right, then you see that only for this probe here, uh, together with the fourth probe, is there a relationship which is significant and strong. Um, there's of course a significant relationship between Sonic Hedgehog and Sonic Hedgehog, which makes sense of course. Um, but the first probe, for example, to SOX21 is not correlated with Sonic Hedgehog. Um, but it's it's a very good database. So if you have and, and this is just a single tissue, right? We're only looking here at the hippocampus, which is a very small part of the brain. Um, you could look at the same relationship and then see, for example, in fat tissue or in heart muscle or in liver, um, if there is a also correlation or if there's a stronger correlation. Yeah, because it might be that in the brain they are co-regulated together, but in fat tissue that they are not. Um, so there's literally hundreds and hundreds of different tissues. Um, and you could see, for example, also if you take the young BXD mice, so the ones which are younger than 100 days, um, compared to the ones which are over 200 days old to see if this relationship changes over time. Um, and of course, all of this data, you can just download, you can put it in R and then do your own uh, analysis on it. Um, but a lot of data, like literally if I've looked at the database once and I think the whole database is like 17 terabytes in total, um, which is 17,000 gigabytes of data, which is currently stored in this one database. Um, and hey, you wouldn't say it from the, from the web design, um, but um, it is a very, very useful database. Like 25 years of data available for free. And there's probably, like I'm, I always say, there's probably a couple of nature publications in there uh, just waiting to be discovered. So, all right, so um, if anyone has any other questions, then uh, just click around the website for yourself. Uh, oh, break time. Yes, yes, definitely break time. Although, yes, let's do a break first. Um, so 10 minute break. I will stop the recording now before the lecture becomes too long.